Good morning, and welcome to this year's third lecture from the Henry Center for Theological Understanding. My name is Joshua Jipp, and today we are blessed to have Dr. Chris Gansky with us. One of the primary goals of the Henry Center is to bridge the gap between the academy and the church. And our speaker today is incredibly well suited to do just that. Chris Gansky pastors in nearby Milwaukee, where I learned last night he actually surfs on Lake Michigan in the winter months. So if you need a fun fact about him. Maybe more importantly, uh, he earned his PhD from Marquette, where he worked on John Calvin, and I think themes related to Eucharist and Ascension. Um, I had the pleasure of getting to know Chris a little bit last year during another Henry Center event. He's clearly gifted, um, both with theological and pastoral wisdom, to help all of us, uh, whatever our current vocation may be. He's gifted to help us think both wisely and theologically. And today, he's going to do so on a most neglected topic, namely the ascension of Christ and its relationship to the mission of the church. So would you please join me in welcoming Dr. Chris Gansky. Well, thanks for the invitation. It's a, it is a, an honor to be able to, to be here, um, to be able to share um, on Ascension. And uh, yeah, thanks. It's just, it's great. So I'm looking at my time here. I, I want to I wanna not go too long. But uh, I want to start, if you, uh, I don't know if how many puzzle people are here. Any puzzle people? Yeah? Um, you know, if you know anything about puzzles, um, the first thing you do, I got to say behind here, I don't have a, I got to get out of pastor preacher mode here in a sec. Uh, if you know anything about puzzles, putting puzzles together, the first thing you do is you find all the edges, right? And you find the border. And once you have all the pieces of the border in place, then you can start putting the individual pieces in place, right? So you're looking at the border, you're looking at the box, so you know where all the pieces go together. Now, um, when it comes to uh, conversations about mission today, I think a lot of times it feels a lot like trying to put pieces of a puzzle together in which we're not really clear what the border is. We're trying to sort of fit these things together. And perhaps the largest piece of the puzzle that I think we struggle to know how it fits in with mission is, um, is the church. What is the relationship between church and mission? Um, can you have mission without the church? Which one is, has priority, church or mission? Um, how do they relate to one another? Now, there's a lot of other puzzle pieces that we struggle to fit together um, with the, the, the bigger picture. Um, but the reality is, is that for the, the border of mission that sort of framed our understanding for mission for centuries has sort of been blown apart, scattered across the table, and we're really not totally sure how all the pieces fit together. Um, I would propose to you this morning or today that the event of Christ's ascension into heaven is the original theological border around which all the pieces fit together the best. And so my goal today is uh, to try to pull out all the pieces and to, to put the border together as best as I can um, in the amount of time that we have. And uh, I, the title of my lecture is The Ascension of Christ and the Renewal of Christian Mission. And my hope is to say um, a number of things about the renewal of Christian mission. And if there is a, a central argument to, to what I'm, I'm saying here, and part of what I want to do is just introduce you to the doctrine of ascension. It's one of the least understood theologically, I think, of, of the great events of Christ. But really, I, I'm very concerned about the renewal of mission. But if there's an argument that I'm making, it's, it's this, is that the renewal of Christian mission also requires a renewal of the church. You need both. And uh, I think the doctrine of ascension helps us with that. So why ascension? Why ascension as a frame for understanding mission? Because everywhere in the New Testament where you see the explicit mention or, of the church, ascension is close at hand. The most prominent example, of course, is recorded in Acts chapter 1. Their ascension and Pentecost are the dramatic opening of the church's missionary history. 
Before Jesus departs, he gives his disciples this mission. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. Now Luke wants us to feel the immediacy of the relationship of Jesus' ascension into heaven and this great commission. It's almost as if he's already sort of lifting off before he finishes what he's saying. <clears throat> the significance of Jesus' ascension at the beginning of the book of Acts is that it really sets in motion the whole plot line of the book. It really sets up Pentecost is to come. And the existence of church and of mission are really born of these quite unexpected cosmological turn of events, right? The disciples, based upon their reaction, <laughs> kind of looking dumbly up at the sky, they were not expecting this. They were not anticipating Jesus ascending into heaven. What they were expecting was bringing of judgment and restoration of Israel. When, Lord, are you going to bring the kingdom, right? But instead of a political and a cultural restoration of the nation of Israel, what Jesus does is he gives his disciples a universal mission to all the nations. And this mission then becomes the alternative to restoration and judgment. Now the angels will tell the disciples, this Jesus, right, he's coming again. In the same way that he departed, he will come back again. And Peter, in, um, later on, will tell in the temple, he'll tell the crowds that heaven had to receive him until the time of restoration, right? So now is the time for mission. Now is the time for mission. So Christian mission really emerges into history as this distinct activity that fills the space between the ascension of Christ and his second coming. Now in Luke Acts, Christ's ascension is the hinge between this two-volume work. Uh, Luke has actually two accounts of the ascension in the gospel and also in, in Acts. So in Acts, Ascension is the start of a new history of God among the nations, but in the Gospel of Luke, Ascension functions somewhat differently. Ascension is more of a summative event, kind of like a capstone. Uh, and I think this is very important, uh, even as we understand mission, because it relates to the content of mission. <clears throat> the Ascension plays a role of bringing to fulfillment all the messianic expectations of salvation for Israel while expanding those promises to all the nations. Ascension marks the climax and the completion of Jesus' work on earth. It's sort of, think of ascension as kind of the New Testament way of saying mission accomplished, right? It's been completed. He, sit, he sat down at the right hand of the Father. Uh, St. Augustine reflecting on uh, ascension and its significance as a feast says this, this is that festival which confirms the grace of all the festivals together, without which the profitableness of every other festival would have perished. For unless the Savior had ascended into heaven, his nativity would have come to nothing, and his passion would have been born no fruit for us, and his most holy resurrection would have been useless. Ascension is inclusive, in a sense, of all the works of Christ, of the earthly life of Christ, and ratifies it and validates it in heaven. So, returning back to the Gospel of Luke, in Luke's account of the ascension in the Gospel. So what we see in the Gospel of Luke in the end is Jesus is also given a great commission uh, to his, and you can imagine, right, we have these different great commissions, I'm calling them great commission stories, these, and Jesus probably having multiple different kinds of conversations with his disciples before he's leaving, right? And so one of the conversations he's having, and he's telling them, they're all surprised. And, and this is one of the themes at the end of the Gospel of Luke, right? The road through Emmaus and to his disciples in, in the upper room. These things had to happen according to the scriptures. They're completely um, surprised that the Messiah was crucified, that he suffered and, and died and rose again. And Jesus is like, these things are fulfilled by the scriptures. And, he want, and Jesus wants them to know that these are in the scriptures. And I think this is very important. And this is one of the important pieces that Ascension does as a doctrine as a whole, is it ties together uh, all the historic longings and anticipations and promises of the Old Testament with the New Testament, right? It's, a, it's very much a hinged document. 
So mission then, what this means is that the mission of the church will always be to the time, the end of time, uniquely grounded in the history of Israel. That you will never get past, you can never move past the Jewish Jesus, the Palestinian man, the one who was, you know, the son of Mary, the brother of Joseph and Josie's, right? This particular humanity is so important to mission. And the disciples are witnesses. They're witnesses to these things. And Jesus says, I want you to proclaim to the nations the forgiveness of sins, the gift of the Spirit, right? And so here's Luke's account of the ascension. So Jesus led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. And while he led them out as far as, <clears throat> and while he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple blessing God. So here you have this sense of the ascension, uh, gives a sense of benediction, joyful completion to the gospel story. While in Acts, ascension opens up a slightly more mysterious beginning to a new chapter of God in history. Um, if we had time, and I cut this out of my talk, I could, we could talk about uh, ascension and mission in the Gospel of John and the Gospel of Mark, but I just want to focus um, the, in the last Gospel here, uh, the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew gives no descriptive account of the ascension, but that doesn't mean that it's not important for Matthew. And in fact, it's quite important, as I'll argue. Everything in Matthew's framing of the Great Commission assumes the theological reality of Jesus' ascension. And an understanding how this is the case in the context of Matthew actually then draws us a little bit more deeply into the theological significance of ascension for mission. The first thing I want you to notice about Matthew's account is the setting. The disciples went to Galilee, and Jesus directs them to meet him up on a mountain. Now, in Matthew's gospel, as is the case in the Old Testament as a whole, ascending mountains has special significance, right? Because mountains are places where the presence of God is uniquely present and special. They're places of revelation. And in the gospel of Matthew, uh, going up mountains is very important. They're places of revelation, right? Sermon on the Mount, Transfiguration, and now you have this great commission. So, the disciples ascend the mountain, and they receive this mission to go out to make disciples of the nations. Um, Jesus' final words in the Gospels are, Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now, Matthew gives no direct account of the ascension, but going up the mountain is suggestive of his eventual ascension into heaven. Now, the first time that we meet Jesus on a mountain in the Gospel of Matthew um, is very different. Jesus is tempted by the devil, right? He's brought to a mountaintop, <clears throat> and the devil makes a promise that he will give him all the power and all the glory of the nations if he will just fall down and worship him, right? Um, in Luke, in, in Matthew 4, the devil, we're just quoting Matthew here, the devil took him up to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory, and he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Now, the temptation scene provides an important foil for the Great Commission scene. In the Great Commission scene there, we have Jesus going up on a mountain um, and being exalted, anticipating his ultimate exaltation as the king who has the power and glory of all the nations around him. And, but he doesn't promise his disciples the power and glory of the nations, but he sends them out on a mission to become, to make disciples of all the nations. And he says this, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. And it's precisely here that we see Matthew grounds mission and the reality of the ascension. Let me explain. What, is, what exactly does Jesus mean when he says all authority in heaven and earth have been given to him? This is a, a phrase, a direct verbal link uh, to Daniel 7, verses 13 and 14. And the vision that Daniel has of the Son of Man. And I want to read it for you. This is Daniel 13, uh, 7, 13 and 14. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like the Son of Man, and he came to the Ancient of Days, and it was pre presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom 
that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. And his dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, one that shall not be destroyed. Now, the key verbal links uh, between Matthew and Daniel are the words all and given. The all here uh, refers to the kind of universality of Jesus's authority in heaven and on earth. It spans heaven and earth. Uh, the given part uh, is that Jesus, when he ascends into heaven, something happens to him. Something happens to him. He is given a status that he did not possess merely as Jesus of Nazareth. Now, a little more background from Daniel 7 is helpful to sort of fill out the picture of ascension a little bit more. Um, the context of the Son of Man's enthronement in Daniel 7 is one that emerges in this conflicted space of heaven and earth. Um, in, in heaven, you see God described as the Ancient of Days, and that around him sort of throngs of angels and heavenly beings, like fire and coming from the thrones. It's just like the most glorious scene, gathered like a courtroom, ready to render judgment on the nations. And then below the clouds, you have this depiction of these beasts, the four beasts, which represents nations, that are rampaging their way through creation, leaving death and destruction in their wake. And then you have, in the middle of this, kind of in the center, separating the two different accounts, you have this intermediate figure, the Son of Man, riding on the clouds. Now, Son of Man, there's a lot of controversy and debate about the meaning and what, how it relates to Jesus' ministry. But in the Aramaic, Son of Man simply means one like a human. It's not quite a title, I don't think, for Daniel. I think Bana uses the phrase as a, as a way to simply, dis, in part, to distinguish the humanity of the one on the cloud, right on the clouds from the beastly character of the nations. But clearly in Daniel, even in Daniel, the Son of Man is no ordinary human being. In the ancient Near East and the Hebrew Scriptures, only divinity rides on the clouds. Clouds are a bridge between heaven and earth, a transversal of the realms. Clouds are often associated with God's a victory over the nations, his majesty. And so there's no other instance of human beings riding on clouds except for this, this passage here, which is why the Son of Man is such a confounding figure, right? And this is likely why Jesus was accused of blasphemy for the Sanhedrin. If you remember, when they force him to say, are you the Son of God? And Jesus associates himself with the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Father in the clouds of heaven. Jesus says, and this is Matthew 26, but I tell you from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. And it's at this point when they kind of tear their robes and scream blasphemy. Now, when Jesus says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, he is clearly associating himself with this exalted Son of Man figure from Daniel 7 that rides on the clouds. To him has been given dominion and glory and a kingdom over all peoples, nations, and languages. And by linking himself with this figure from Daniel 7, he is communicating something about his cosmic authority. Jesus has assumed cosmic history for himself. In his book, Ascension and Ecclesia, Douglas Farrow observes that ascension is not just a story of departure, but also a story of arrival. In Acts, we have the account of the departure, right? As they were looking up, he was lifted up, and the cloud took them from their sight as they were looking on. In Daniel, Daniel shows us arrival above the clouds. And behold, the clouds of heaven, there was one like a son of man. He came to the ancient of days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom. And it is the presence of this figure right in the clouds that helps us see these, uh, these accounts as, as somehow linked together. Acts gives us the below the clouds view, and Daniel gives us above the clouds view. Now, from Daniel's perspective, ascension is one of victorious triumph, glorious worship. The disciples cannot see this, right? They're below the clouds. They're looking up. And in fact, they're almost stunned. And the angels, the angel says, men of Galilee, why are you looking up? Right? This Jesus who, who went will come in the same way, like snap out of it, right? Now, Peter, a mere 10 days later on Pentecost, will understand and confirm for us what has happened on this Ascension Day. It was nothing less than Jesus' heavenly enthronement. 
and he will ascribe to the ascension the most quoted Old Testament verse in all the New Testament, Psalm 110. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Now, just so, I mean, I'm dealing very narrowly with ascension in the Gospels and Acts. Ascension runs throughout the entire New Testament. And I think it's a point of, of, of significant, great significance that the most quoted Old Testament text in all the New Testament is Psalm 110. What difference does this make, then, for how we think about mission? The fact that Jesus is ascended into heaven means the whole cosmos has been reorganized around Jesus of Nazareth. Without this event, the mission of the church has no authoritative, authoritative basis whatsoever. So how, how does this make a difference in terms of how we... Let's bring it down from below the clouds for, <laughs> for a while here. What difference does this make for how we think about missionary practice of the church and the nature of the church? And I want to offer you four, uh, four theses of mission and ascension. Thesis one, Christian mission originates as a response to the exaltation of Jesus. Christian mission originates as a response to the exaltation of Jesus. Where does mission begin? Where is mission grounded? Mission begins not merely as a response to the command of Jesus. Mission is a response to his exaltation. The command flows out of the exaltation, that reality. Now, exaltation of Jesus refers to both his resurrection from the dead and his ascension into heaven. And these are distinct from one another, but they're very closely related. Jesus' resurrection and ascension changed the fabric of history. They changed the fabric of the cosmos. They make mission possible. They make mission a necessity. And the events of Jesus' exaltation become really the primary focus of Peter's Pentecost sermon. And he makes clear that the events of Pentecost, everything that people are, strange things that are going on, are because of the exaltation. And I want to give you just a snippet of that sermon and give you a few comments on it. This is Acts 2, starting in verse 32. This Jesus raised up, this Jesus God raised up, and, all, and of all that we are witnesses. Resurrection, right? Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, ascension, and having received from the Father the promised Spirit, Pentecost, he poured out on this that you are now hearing and seeing. For David did not ascend to the heavens, but he himself says in Psalm 110, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now in appealing to King David, Peter makes the point that not only does Jesus fulfill all the Davidic promises expected of the Messiah, he surpasses them. Right? David never ascended into heaven. Uh, but he spoke of one who did, right? The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies my footstool, your footstool. So in ascending into heaven, Jesus is exalted to the right hand of God, and he is made Lord in Christ. There has been, again, a fundamental shift in the direction of history, which demands a response of mission. So mission then arises out of this need to announce a new political reality. Jesus is Lord. That's a new political reality. Jesus is Lord. Now, I want to pause for a moment and just ask the question, well, what do we mean? What, is, what does uh, Peter mean when he says that, that God made him Lord in Christ? What does it mean to talk about Jesus being made? The transformation here is we're not talking about the preexistent son as if he needs to become more glorified and divine than he is, but we're really talking about Jesus' identity of, as Jesus of Nazareth, the historical his, his, his redemptive historical identity, something happens to him. He undergoes this change in status which shifts the fabric of the universe and causes all things and all creation to have to relate to him differently than it did before. Through the ascension, Jesus enters fully into his Davidic role as the Messiah, but not just for Israel, but now for all the nations. And as the one who has been made Lord in Christ, everything has now been put under his subjection and rule. And so with his coronation in heaven, Jesus is invested with the Father, 
by the Father with power and authority to rule the cosmos through the Holy Spirit that he sends upon his church. And then Pentecost then represents the beginning of Christ's heavenly rule, whereby he sends his spirit upon this church to announce, to establish, to administer his kingdom until he shall come again. So the origin of Christian mission then begins as this response to this new political situation. Jesus of Nazareth, crucified, risen from the dead, ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of God. And mission is calling people to align their lives with this new reality. Understanding that mission starts in response to Jesus' exaltation means that the renewal of mission depends upon returning again and again to the ongoing reality of his heavenly reign. And the primary way we do this is through worship. Through worship. After Jesus ascends into heaven, as we already saw, Luke's gospel says the disciples worshipped him. They worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising God. Matthew's account of the Great Commission as well includes a mention of the disciples worshiping Jesus on the mountainside. Mission is closely associated with worship because worship is the fuel of mission. Worship is the fuel of mission. Mission is a response to the exaltation of Jesus. And the only way that mission in the life of the church is sustained is when a life of the church's worship is sustained, right? So at the deepest level, mission at the end of the day is about worship. It's doxological. And that's the pattern you see again in the New Testament and the Acts that, that what drives and fuels mission is always some connection of worship. It's not the salvation of souls. It's not the transformation of the culture. It's not the preservation of the, the Christian nation. It's worship. And that's the image you see again and again. Uh, pictures of the end of history in Revelation and Isaiah and Daniel there are always pictures of the nations gathered around the throne of God worshiping. So when it comes between, to the relationship between worship and mission, ascension means the church is the kind of institution that is simultaneously drawn upwards in, in worship as it is pushed outward in mission. Right? That's the pattern of mission. You go up to go out. Unfortunately, I think too often in churches today, we, we tend to set these uh, against one another as if worship and mission are somehow in competition with one another. But again, the ascension forbids the dichotomy between these. Church does not have to choose whether it will be defined by the depth and the integrity of its worship life or its faithfulness to mission. Both acts flow from the same reality. Both have integrity only in that they are connected to one another. Mission is the church's response to the lordship of Jesus Christ. And when people respond to the gospel, whether through through believing faith and conversion or bringing more and more of their life under the lordship of Christ, where worship happens, right? And John, John Piper, let the nations be glad, that, that's the great insight of that book. Christian mission originates as a response to the exaltation of Jesus. So that's thesis one. Thesis two. Ascension integrates mission into the heart of ecclesiology. Ascension integrates mission into the heart of ecclesiology. Jesus' ascension into heaven not only marks the beginning of mission, but also of the church. Ascension helps us understand the right relationship between church and mission. In the light of ascension, Christian mission um, presupposes the reality of the church. Mission presupposes the church. Trying to separate church and mission is like trying to separate the soul and the body. You can separate them, you can distinguish them, but neither can exist without the other. <clears throat> now, this is a fairly controversial claim today, and a lot of segments of like missional church and discussions about mission, where the trend is to reinterpret church at its best sometimes as mission. The church is mission, or the church is movement, or uh, was it Reggie McNeil talks about the church is like an airport terminal, nobody wants to live there, you're just passing through. There's a sense in which, which the church is completely instrumentalized to the task of mission. And so the great problem of mission is actually the church. But it is not setting mission free from the institutional church that will lead us to the renewal of mission, but it's rather recovering a reinvigorated understanding of the church in the light of the ascension. So what does ascension have to do with church? 
as I said, ascension marks the beginning of the church in history. When reading Acts, we tend to skip over from the ascension straight to Pentecost. And if I were to ask you, well, where's the first, what's the first vision or picture of the church you get in the, in, in the book of Acts? Most of us go to Acts 2, right? And they were all together and they had everything in common and they were sharing with one another all their possessions, right? So you have this very romantic understanding of the church where there's not a ton of dogma and, and uh, institutionalism. It's a very romantic, uh, organic community. Um, not only is this not really a, a good reading of that text, but we've actually already passed over a really uh, important scene about the church, which happens between the Ascension and Pentecost. And that's in Acts 1. Um, and there, what you see is something like an institutional church preparing for mission, preparing for Pentecost. There's the identification by name of all the apostles that Jesus appointed. Um, there's a numerical estimate of the size of the church, 120 people. There is an ordination, election, and service of having Matthias replace Judas. There's prayer, and there's preaching, and there's teaching. All that is happening. <laughs> All that is happening prior to Pentecost. Church um, exists prior to mission, and what you see in Acts is that the churches take care in vital institutional business to prepare itself for mission, right? Now, just as uh, mission is first brought into clear focus when the <clears throat> in the light of the ascension, it's the same with the church. The church becomes visible in the world when Jesus becomes invisible. The church becomes visible in the world when Jesus becomes invisible. Prior to the ascension, the disciples really don't seem to have a clear grasp of the category of church. And why would they, right? They don't see the need. Jesus is with them bodily. Now, certainly Jesus foreshadows the church in numerous ways in the Gospels, right? But when they thought about the fulfillment of Jesus' ministries, in the corporate sense, their understanding is that it's the restoration of Israel when the kingdom of God fully comes, right? And this is confirmed by the rarity of references to ecclesia in the Gospels, right? In Matthew, or rather in Mark, Luke, and John, you have no uh, references to the word ecclesia. Of course, you have references to, you know, a church or, you know, different words. Only the Gospel of, of Matthew has the word ecclesia, the Gospel of the church, but it's only three. But when you shift from Acts on, you have 21 references to church, Ecclesia and Acts, 67 references to Ecclesia in letters of Paul, 19 references to Ecclesia in Revelation, and that's not even counting the other epistles. The point is this, is that Ecclesia comes into view, just like mission, in that historical space between Jesus' ascension and second coming, right? Uh, the great missiologist Leslie Newbegin observed this is in uh, Household of God. He says, It is surely a fact of inexhaustible significance that what our Lord left behind him was not a book, nor a creed, nor a system of thought, nor a rule of life, but a visible community. He committed the entire work of salvation to that community. So after Jesus' ascension, Ecclesia becomes a central organizing concept for the people of God. And again, why is this the case? Why might this be the case? The nation of Israel has rejected Jesus as its Messiah. The question then becomes, where will God's reign and rule be represented historically in the world? And the life of the church comes into view because the church uh, transcends the national borders. The church needs to be visible in history because Jesus is invisible in heaven. And this means that the life of the church is the place on earth where we get a glimpse in reality, of what the lordship of Jesus looks like in heaven. So, ascension integrates mission into the heart of ecclesiology. Thesis three. I think I'm going to make it. Ascension, uh, thesis three. Ascension identifies the primary activity of mission as witness. Ascension identifies the primary activity of mission as witness. As followers of Jesus, the disciples when fully expected that when he brought the restoration of the kingdom that they would be given positions of power and influence in the kingdom. Something like equivalent like governmental positions. That they would be rulers. But Jesus transforms their understanding of power 
and of mission. You will be, receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be witnesses. He doesn't say, you'll be my rulers or my governors or my high priests or generals, that you will be my witnesses, empowered and invested with authority, not institutional power of the temple or of the, of the empire, but invested with a power which comes down from heaven, from my heavenly throne. And that power will be activated through witness. Through your witness, the power will have the effect of making my identity and my rule and lordship visible and felt in the world, right? And that's what you see in the book of Acts. The power of the Spirit comes manifest in the life and activity of the disciples and the church. And so this word witness is so important. Um, in the book of Acts, it's used 20 times. The book of John, it's 28 times. Um, a witness, what is a witness? A, w a witness is one that testifies, uh, bears witness uh, to events, things, occurrences. A witness is a person that's seen something, heard something, but also, especially the case with the disciples, been changed by something. When the, pop, the, the apostles are in the process of choosing Judas's um, replacement, one of the requirements is that this person had to be a witness of the resurrected Jesus. And Peter says this in his sermon, we heard already, he's like, we were witnesses of the fact that he was raised from the dead, right? So they're not dispassionate observers. They are completely transformed by what they saw and experienced in the resurrected Jesus. Essential to the activity of witness is that it is a responsive act. This is important about mission. Mission is a responsive act. It is not an imitative act. And here, let me just... Uh, briefly draw a contrast between mission understood in the light of ascension with the popular idea of incarnational ministry. Incarnational ministry or ministry, at least as I've read about it and experienced it, tends to be very imitative, right? Jesus became the incarnate son of God. Generally, an incarnational ministry means three things, right? He was sent, we should be sent. He was an embodied relational presence, we should be a body relational presence. In becoming God, becoming man, he contextualized, we should contextualize. Let me just say, I affirm all those things. I don't think you need incarnational ministry to get them. But an essential approach to mission is in this incarnational mode is very imitative. An essential approach to mission is very different. It is not about imitation. It is about response. Ascension cannot be turned into a method or a model for doing ministry. It's not a method. It's not a model for doing ministry. Uh, you cannot imitate Jesus' ascension. You can only respond to it. But the reality is this, is that imitation will not sustain the church and mission. It simply cannot. It's absolutely exhausting, in fact. To try to be like God, to try to be like Jesus, is not a, a way to sustain our mission. Responding to his heavenly reign is the only thing that keeps mission going. And this is what you see again and again in the book of Acts, right? The mission of the apostles is defined really as a responsive act to the exaltation of Jesus. Think of the story of Paul especially, right? On the Damascus Road, who does he encounter? The ascended Lord who knocks him off his horse. This becomes the defining moment of his life that drives everything that he does. And he repeats the story on multiple occasions. And at one point when he's defending his ministry to King Agrippa, he's saying, after he shared his story of his conversion and his conversation with the ascended Lord, he says, how could I be disobedient to the heavenly vision? How could I be disobedient to the heavenly vision? Now, when mission is understood in the category of witness, the vitality of mission then is located not in the search for new methods for reaching the culture or innovative, innovative ways of being the church. Let me just say I'm not against <laughs> all that stuff. But it's primarily located in grappling with the subject matter of mission, which is the ascended, exalted Lord. When witness is at the heart of mission, it ensures that the crucified and resurrected Jesus remains a true object of mission. And the real struggle for mission in the life of the church at the end of the day is continually living out of an encounter with this heavenly Jesus. That's the biggest task of mission. Now, uh, many of you will know that the Greek word for witness is also the word that we derive martyr. And we know what happens to martyrs, right? They die for their faith. They suffer. 
And I think this really points us to the, the experiential, holistic, total life-giving activity of, of witness. Witness points to the mission as this holistic activity that combines word and deed, right? True witness is never without words, never, but is never mere words. Witness helps us understand how to hold these together, the reality of word and deed in the activity of mission. And the example I would give you is Stephen, the first martyr who becomes a real embodiment of what is the church to be in mission. And you remember Luke describes Stephen this way. He says, he was full of grace and power and doing great wonders and signs among the people. Stephen had deeds, <laughs> but he also had words. Remember, he's arrested on, on, on false charges of blasphemy, and he's brought hauled before the Sanhedrin and questions, and there he delivers the longest sermon in the book of Acts, <laughs> where he powerfully testifies to Jesus as the Messiah, whom the people have rejected because of their unbelief. And in a rage, they go at Stephen, and it says they're grinding their teeth, and they rush at him, and they drag him out of the city, and they stone him to death. And yet, in the midst of this violence, what we learn is, is that Stephen has this heavenly vision of the ascended Christ. Full of, this is Luke. Full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed into heaven. And he saw the glory of God and Jesus at the right hand of God. And he said, behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Here again, we have this above-the-clouds view of the ascension, which ties it into Luke or into Daniel 7. Stephen is a man who knows who he is. He is a witness of Jesus Christ in word and in deed, and he has utter clarity about this facts, about this reality, which allows him to be an unshakable uh, and non-anxious presence in the face of chaos, emotional turmoil, and violent opposition. I think it's very easy for the church today to get swept up in all the wave of anxiety and to lose our sense of identity as the church. And the only way that we will be able to endure and maintain our distinct identity as a church is to continue looking up, right? At the glory of God, at the Son of Man, seated at the right hand of the Father, understanding that this Son of Man, what he was the one who was hated and rejected, has already suffered death in the grave and has gloriously triumphed over all his enemies. In him we see our true selves. See, in being witnesses, we find our identity as the church. That's our identity, witnesses to the, to the Son of Man in the heavens. So Ascension identifies the primary activity of mission as witness. And now the, the last one. Ascension helps us cultivate an otherworldly imagination for the church and mission. Ascension helps us cultivate an otherworldly imagination for the church and mission. Now, if Jesus had taken his throne in Jerusalem, as the disciples were expecting, he would have become one king among many kings. But in ascending into heaven, he becomes the king of all, receiving all authority on heaven and earth. Mission, then, is not just to Israel. Mission is to all the nations. It can't be narrowly circumscribed. It is cosmic in scope. As he goes up, the church goes out, right? Jesus is the Lord to the very ends of the earth in all its heights and depths and its breadth. And it is witness to this in the depths of Jesus' lordship in every area of life that's so needed, I think, in the church today. This is what Jesus means in Matthew when he sends his disciples to make disciples of the nations. Now, too often, I think we think like the disciples before the ascension. We want to really circumscribe the mission of what it's about and who it's for. But ascension, again, explodes this. It just explodes all the boundaries and all the limits that we want to put on mission. Ascension means that Jesus of Nazareth, as the enthroned in heaven, now encompasses all things. Nothing falls outside of his jurisdiction. Someday, everything broken will be made right. Everything disordered, healed. Everything fragmented, embraced by his wholeness he brings. 
Christian mission then flows out, not only from the hope that someday earth will be a place where Jesus is all in all and fills all things, but with the confidence that there is a place right now, a created place called heaven, in which this is all true right now, and that the church in its life of worship, in the power of the Spirit, participates in this reality here and now. Now, an important question. What are the cumulative effects that we can expect of the church's witness in the world? Should Christian mission aim at the transformation of the world? I mean, if we're saying that Jesus, the goal of mission is that God would be all in all and that Jesus might fill all things, does that mean that, that the goal of mission is, is cultural transformation? Or the goal of mission is Christianization of the nation? And again, remember the Great Commission. Jesus said, go out into the world and make disciples not of individuals, but of nations, of collectives, right? What does this mean exactly? How does this fit? This is a really important question because it's really at the center of a lot of debates about mission today. So a lot of the debates about the role or the propriety of social justice as part of uh, Christian mission, or even, and this is the opposite political, from the political side, is the rise of Christian nationalism within our politics. These are all questions that are related to this question. Answering this question, uh, I think, requires, again, clear thinking about the church. What is the church and what is its role in God's mission? I think it is very problematic when Christians make the central goal of mission some form of cultural transformation. I think that's a category mistake. Uh, mission is otherworldly. It's heavenly. It aims at heaven. And now by this, I don't mean it's just like get people saved so they can go to heaven. No. Part of the problem we have is we don't know what heaven is. We think of heaven as this sort of sweet by and by, this immaterial place. No. Heaven, heaven is the place of re where God is all in all in a created way. The resurrected body of Jesus is like the, the material cornerstone of heaven. Someday heaven and earth will come back together. So when we think about heaven, don't think about uh, this other place uh, or, you know, beyond materiality. It's, it's another time, morally speaking, eschatologically speaking. Mission is heavenly. The first and foremost mission is about bearing witness to the reality of the exalted Christ who is in heaven. And so mission is calling people through faith and repentance to personally align their lives with this new political reality. But again, don't hear me as just saying, well, then mission is just evangelism. It is never, ever less than evangelism. I just want to say that. It's never, ever less than evangelism. But it, it, it's more than that. See, what happens when people become Christians, right? Uh, what happens when a, a whole group of people become Christians? When a, and maybe a whole tribe or a whole nation become Christians. And then they gather, and there's a church that comes into existence, and they begin to live in obedience to the lordly reign of Jesus. They begin to show a different way of being human in the world. And what eventually happens is that societies do change, right? Even though cultural transformation is not the goal of mission, it is a fruit of mission. It is an undeniable fruit of Christian mission. There's no denying the fact that when there is wide population at a wide scale level become Christianized, that it brings about massive political and social shifts into the world. And really, I mean, the, the history of Christian mission is a history that demonstrates that Christianization of a nation always brings, or people, brings massive cultural transformation. And there's so many great books on this. Yeah. Um, Rodney Stark's The Rise of Christianity, Larry Hurtado's Destroyer of the Gods, Dana Roberts, love Dana Roberts, Christian Mission, um, Andrew Wall's work, um, Tom Holland, secular historian, charting the history of, I mean, you just look at these and you, they just like, this is what happens when the gospel goes in, churches are formed, people change how they live, it completely reorganizes it. That's really what you see in the book of Acts as well. I mean, in the book of Acts, this is the argument of Cabin Rowe in his book, um, A World Upside Down. It's like, the, the disciples aren't trying to seize power and change the Roman Empire, but, but just as the gospel goes out through the Roman Empire, it just reverberates and it just shakes it politically and culturally but not because they're trying to. Right institutional thinking about the church in relationship to the world, I think, is really key. How do these things fit together, right? Um, the future of the church does not depend upon staying relevant to the culture. Can I just say that? 
<laughs> Again, the future of the church does not depend upon staying relevant to the surrounding culture. The future of the church does not depend upon the protection of a secularized Christian nation state. The martyrdom, again, of Stephen embodies the right posture of the church in relationship to the world. It is always a looking up, a gazing into heaven, bearing witness to the glory, and all Christian culture making flows forth as a fruit of this collective witness to the heavenly reign of Jesus. As a, the church, we, the church possesses a, an, an institutional otherworldliness that allows it to actually be truly countercultural. Its institutional center is not located in, on earth, on heaven, or on earth, it's it located in heaven. Christ the head, the founder, the foundation of the church does not occupy space on earth, which means as an institution, the church in it is ordered to an alternative heavenly economy. The economy is the kingdom of God, and it takes its direction from the heavenly Jesus, right? Where all things are ordered around him. Okay, I'm bringing it close. I'm bringing it home. To be the church takes up real institutional space in the world, but not as an institution that enters into direct competitive relationships with other institutions. Again, if Jesus had, instead of ascended into heaven, had just restored the kingdom of Israel, there would have resulted some kind of Christian nation or national church as a result. And it would have been just one more institution in competition with other institutions, namely the Roman Empire. But essentially means that Jesus is the king of kings. There's no competition between Jesus and Caesar. There's no competition between Jesus and Joe Biden. There's no competition between Jesus and Trump. They, they do not inhabit the same space and time and exercise the same power Indeed, there are conflicting allegiances that emerge as followers of Jesus between our, our identities in nations and, and tribes and ethnicities and that of Jesus. And these conflicting allegiances sometimes lead to suffering. And through the centuries, the consequences of this are persecution and martyrdom, as we saw with, Caesar, with Stephen. But it's not through seizing political power that the church resolves its conflicts with the world. It's through martyrdom. And yet... Despite the conflicts that emerge between the church and the world and the various institutions, the church is not trying to replace the state, is not trying to replace nonprofits. It's not vying for some kind of power and influence as an institution in the world. Its relevance is determined completely and wholly how it positions itself in relationship to the heavenly reality of Jesus. Now, again, in church planning circles, which I planted a church 10 years ago, I know something of this, church revitalization settings. I mean, there's just a lot of talk. We talk a lot about branding and relevance and, and you know, kind of spiritual market share. And the problem with this is, is that it mistakenly thinks that the church belongs to the kind of the sphere of the marketplace, but just in a spiritual sense. But institutions of the marketplace are not necessary institutions. They're not, they exist according to the ongoing desires of the market, right? An ever-evolving consumer market. The church does not fit into this, this landscape because the church is a necessary institution. It is a necessary institution. It exists because God wills for it to exist. To be ecclesia, again, called out ones, right? The elect ones. One of Paul's arguments in Romans 9 through 11 is this, is that the church exists on the basis of God's electing grace, and that not even human disobedience can frustrate and thwart ultimately the church. I mean, that is a necessary institution, right? It does not exist by human will, or even can cease to exist by human failure. It exists because of the will of God in history. Embracing the otherworldliness of the church as an institution may seem like a recipe for its ultimate demise and impotence, and yet, it is precisely because the church does not derive its relevance from the world that it can be relevant to the world. The ascended Christ makes the church relevant because he is the world's future. He is the right side of history. Calling people to faith in Jesus is calling them to get on the right side of history. Okay, I just want to close here. I want to give the Apostle Paul the last words. In Ephesians 1, at the very end of his prayer, he says this, This Jesus... This Jesus, God raised up from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. 
far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the age to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all things. Um, but there's, there's a gap between, you know, theology and missiology or theologians and missiologists. And then, and then where, where does the church fit in between those two? Um, and so I appreciate it very much what you've done here. G give us as people prepare then for their questions, but give us a little bit of the, of your own personal history. How did you come to this? That is to say, you, you know, most of the time, uh, mission is not, it's not been driven by ascension. It's been driven by, this is a command of Jesus, Right. And, and so part of it is how did you come to that? Why the gap in your study in the church in that I don't know that this has been a view that has been embraced. That is because we, don't, we have not focused on the ascension. Yeah. And at the end of the day, what are the differences in, in implications or applications from looking at either a command of Jesus for mission mm -hmm. over against the ascension as the impetus for mission? Yeah. Well, a lot of questions there, but, but start, yeah. start, start yeah, with yeah. just your own pilgrimage. <clears throat> Yeah, so I'm a pastor of a Reformed church in, in the Reformed tradition, and um, I think there's a special sensitivity to ascension in that tradition, in part that goes back to the Reformation and the debates between uh, Calvin and, and the Lutherans over the nature of presence. And Calvin came uh, back again and again to the ascension to argue against the Lutheran view of... of um, of the presence of, of Christ physically in the supper. And so that, that, I mean, just being aware and sensitized, all traditions have their unique gifts. Um, that also accents pneumatology, the spirit as well in the Reformed tradition, because for Calvin, union in, in the Eucharist is, is pneumatological. Uh, so th those are some of the backgrounds. But sh shortly after I finished my, my PhD at Marquette, and I was not, I mean, from when I really started in earnest in my graduate studies, I was like hard charging towards an academic position, writing and research, like full on. And I, I always loved the church. <laughs> um, and I always wanted, I always saw my work as a potential future scholar as, as to the church. Um, but, but it was a point at which the Lord just called me to plant a church. <laughs> I was serving in, a, in a, a Christian Reformed church and there was a group of us that lived in the city of Milwaukee and there were really no Reformed <laughs> churches and, and just not a lot of good gospel witness churches in, in the city of Milwaukee, and conversation started, and, and it became clear to me, it's like, you know, I have strong views about what the church is, and what it should be as a grad student, um, what it should do different, and I could, you know, you know, go into academia and write about it, or, or I could become a pastor, and I could try to just do it, <laughs> and I took the latter, and uh, yeah, and so a, a lot of this, my thinking here grows out of, and then, you know, immersing myself in a lot of the missional church literature as a church planner, and, and just being really struck by the conversation, and, and frustrated at times, too, about how anti-church it is at times. I think that's one of the big things, like I just, not all, it's a very complex conversation. Thank you, that's very helpful. Uh, other, others with questions? Yeah, please. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gansky, for your uh, very insightful uh, talk. Uh, you mentioned how the church's mission ought to be or is um, not an imitation of Christ's incarnation, but is a response to uh, Christ's ascension and enthronement. And that reminded me of uh, Todd Billings' book, who he also really criticized the incarnational model of ministry. but. For him and others, it's union with Christ and participation in the Holy Spirit that grounds that. And I was wondering whether um, participation would be a helpful category, or is it something different that you're trying to advocate for? Yeah, so I'm, I'm quite familiar with, with uh, uh, Todd's work in that, that essay, and it's definitely informed my thinking. And he's, he's thinking, uh, we're kind of di working in different registers a little bit. I would affirm full stop everything that he would affirm about participation, I think. Participation is very much 
um, again, but participation understood in pneumatological terms, right? Um, I'm really getting at this question. I mean, Todd doesn't really talk about mission there either. He's talking more about the ministry of the church. And, and let me just say, I mean, I've, I've been very critical of incarnational ministry, and I'm happy to talk if people want to do that. Um, but I, just to say, too, I, I, I very much affirm the goods that it has achieved. I just like, I think you get there in other ways. And I do think that there's, there's real dangers that I've seen um, when, when that, that's your kind of driving metaphor theologically. So thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, please. Um, Chris, thanks for a great lecture. Um, doing a PhD on Ascension and I'm a church planter. So oh, great. I'm resonating, well, I'm resonating with talk. all of it. Uh, one, one question, just cause you mentioned it, uh, John's gospel. That's one of my areas of study. Do yep. you want to just give us a tidbit of what you would have said about that? Yeah. Yeah, so I think you, the uh, pneumatology is the root in John's gospel. Well, one, John's gospel, you have ascension of Jesus has already ascended in chapter three, right? Like when you, I mean, there's a kind of simultaneity of the events of Christ in his exalted state that runs throughout John that's very hard to like piece together. Uh, Richard Bach, uh, yeah, I think Richard Bauckham has a nice essay in John's gospel on ascension. Um, but in John's gospel in particular, I think the, the, cl the clear link with mission is this. Is so in John 16, Jesus says, I have to go away. I have to go away. If I, don't come, if I don't go away, the comforter won't come, right? Well, what is he talking about there? He's talking about his ascension. And he makes it very clear in John, like, if I don't come, go, he cannot come. But then he then goes on to describe the ministry of the Spirit. When the Spirit comes, he will come and he will, he will convict the world of, of sin, righteousness, and judgment, right? And, and so when you then go to John 20, where you have the Great Commission in John, where Jesus says, you know, as the Father sent me, I send you, and he breathes on him, on the disciples, the breath of the Spirit, and he gives them the ministry of forgiveness, right? And I think that's there where you see that kind of link, where, okay, so in John's gospel, right, Jesus, the breathing on, you know, I think scholars are like, this is sort of like John's version of Pentecost, mm -hmm. right? Again, John's timeline is not our timeline, <laughs> but there is a way that the, the reality of the ascended Lord is already secured his authority, and now he is giving that to his disciples, and, and, and he is breathing on them, and the ministry of the Spirit is the ministry of the forgiveness of sins. So that's how I would go with John. Eric, thank you for the lecture. Um, question in the relationship you draw between ascension uh, leading to the mission of the church's witness, and you said how uh, therefore, the mission of the church isn't primarily social justice or social ministries. I'm interested, both theologically and as a fellow pastor, pastorally, and the church as an institution, what would, how would you locate theologically or practically the proper role, if at all, of social justice, mercy ministries, things in that category? Thanks for asking that. That's, I was hoping someone would ask that question. Because you could come away uh, from, from my talk thinking, oh, well, I guess that's just a church that has worship services. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll tell you what ministries our church has. Um, so, you know, we, we, we support, we support um, uh, crisis pregnancy centers. We support foster care. We support adoption care. We have ministries uh, regular with, with a local uh, food pantry. We, you know, we have a, a, a lot of different, you know, ministries of mercy. Uh, we have lots of, you know, the relationship of faith and work and discipleship around faith and work and, and culture making is a big part of what we do as well. But I think the difference is this, like it's how you talk about it and how you, how does it fit, right? So, so like when, when we talk about mission, when I talk about mission, I don't try to get everybody's like, we're going to convert the city or we're going to transform the city of Milwaukee. Or, we're going to bring justice. I mean, racial reconciliation, that's another big part ministry, you know, partnering with black churches and conversations there, I just think is just really important. Why? Because the fullness of our humanity as followers of Jesus Christ is only represented when we care about those things that touch us. And, and so on the one hand, I think this is very important because, you know, like we want to change the world. That's what the culture tells us. It's like, as a, as a young person, like you can go out and you can change the world. And, and I don't want to, and I don't mean to be cynical, but like it's a lot harder to change the world than you think. And, uh, um, and it can be, it's so disappointing. And, and what I always try to, especially with when I support people in, in my church that are on the front lines that are like, this is their work, or they're in these ministries, I said, listen, you cannot look 
at the fruit and base you know, your, like, your worth or the value of what you're doing based upon the fruit. Why do you do it? Because you're witnessing to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Don't look for the fruit. Don't look for the effects. The, the goal here is not to change the city. If, if good fruit comes and we can bring down the number of kids in, in foster care in the city of Milwaukee, praise God. We're going to do everything we can, but we're not, you know, again, it's, it's a way of talking, right? Um, it, it is holistic, and, and I, I actually think, too, your best bet at evangelism is you being a church that does this kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Like, if you're not a church that does this stuff, your average person is you're like, okay. But, like, when people, like, that's the deed part. It's so, it's like, wow, these people live in a different kind of way, and they're doing, they're doing the things that I, I know I value, but I, I just don't really feel like I have the motivation to do. So I, I believe it's absolutely important, but it just, it's how you fit it together and how you talk about it that's key. Yeah. Uh, yes, please. Thanks. Thanks for your talk. So I have a question that relates ascension to second coming, and I was wondering how you would uh, associate the two. So for a lot of Christians, um, particularly Augustine and so on, the time between the first and second comings was fundamentally ambiguous. And that includes the church, right? So the church itself is, so the, it's all wheat and tares all around, right? Um, and so uh, when you made comments about like the benefits of the fruit of the church being in particular places with the work of Tom Holland and so on, um, do you see the ascension as sort of working against that ambiguity? Uh, because obviously the ascension happens before the second coming. Um, but so, in other words, do, do you want to affirm that ambiguity? Does the ascension make it clearer, or does that ambiguity remain? What, what, is, what do you mean by ambiguity? Secular. So what, what Augustine would call the seculum. Okay. Yeah. Um, I do think that there is fundamental ambiguity because of the ascension. That, 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 that is the tension, right? I mean, it, 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 it's sort of, this is Douglas Farrow. I mean, I think Douglas Farrow is on this in Ascension and Ecclesia, that there's a way that Jesus is... He's departed our earthly history, right, bodily, and yet he's still present, right? And so I'm not sure I fully understand your question, but I do think that one of the really complicated theological tasks of missiology today is learning how to make really clear distinctions between mission, church, and Christianized culture or Christendom. And that it's very easy. And I, I think the best of the Missio Dei um, tradition coming out of post-war, post-World War II, history of colonialism, very negative about Christendom. And the church needs to get away from Christendom. And, I, and there's a part of that critique that I affirm um, in, insofar as it understands Christianization not in word and sacrament, gospel-based ways, but like bringing a cult, like basically culture, <laughs> bringing Christianity through cultural forces, politics and whatever. Um, but I would say that you can't hate Christendom. <laughs> like, you can dislike a lot of the negative af- aspects of what we call Christendom or Christian culture, but there is an ambiguity there in that it's the fruit of mission, right? I mean, in many ways, like so many of the, the, the ethical questions that we as Americans are dealing with today around abortion, human sexuality, euthanasia, are all questions that are anthropological. And, and you know, so, the declension from those, from a Christian perspective in ways, are shifts in our understanding of humanity that we think don't just impact us as the church, but the whole culture, right? And so it's really, it, there is an ambiguity there where, you know, I, I think as, like in a way, like I want, I want Christian culture to be influential because I believe in life. And yet there's aspects of Christian culture that, that forces itself upon people that, that is, is clearly destructive. And, and so like part of the conversation, and, and perhaps I'm getting a little bit too in the weeds here, is, is, is just knowing how to, to make fine-tuned distinctions between mission and, and Christian culture and church and how they're interrelated. That, I don't know if that answers your question, but... Let me press just, a, I don't know one's at the mic here, but let me press a little further on Missio Dei. Yeah. Uh, what was the impetus uh, uh, after World War II? What was the impetus to move towards the Missio Dei? It seemed to, uh, in a sense, bump it up from what Missio Christos or, or, or the, the church 
give us an assessment. How, how would you define or describe mm -hmm. Missio Day, and then why the move in that direction? What are the what are the implications? Yeah. So Missio Day is a big. Yeah. There's a lot going on there. Um, so, I mean, the Missio Day conversation really emerges out of a combination of the World Council of Churches yep. meetings, ecumenical and missionary. And and really, I mean, this is a, important for mission, history, right? Like, ecumenism and missiology have been together from the early 20th century. So, but in the 1950s and 60s, they're, they're you know, with the fracturing of the European church and the kind of liberalization and modernization of that church, there's a lot of criticism of a kind of post-colonial understandings of mission, which were legit, very on point, that, that's, felt that mission was too ecclesial centric and that it was rooted simply in command, right? Like it's just obey this command. And so it was too much house, it, it lacked that, that bigger narrative understanding of the, the work of God in the world, right? And so there was this push against that becomes in certain circles very anti-church to where, and I think this is what you see in the work of David Bosch and Transforming Mission um, it's, I mean, Moltmann. I mean, there's a kind of view. It's God mission world, yeah. right? That's the God mission world. Church is instrumentalized in that. And um, where the classical understanding is, is God church world, right? Like, so, so there's, there's a whole lot going on there. Um, but I, I think it's a real mistake <laughs> to try to pry and ground mission somewhere else than in the person of Jesus, mm -hmm. who is, you know, the second person of the Trinity. Um, Ascension as a framework for understanding mission is not any less Trinitarian or any less, but, it, but what it does too is it grounds it in the historic person of Jesus. And a lot of Missio Dei theology tends to, I think, get easily absorbed within various kinds of uh, narratives of kind of, the, a kind of visions for the just society, which in the churches or even explicit belief in Jesus is not really necessary. So I, I think that's problematic, and I think, I, I guess... <laughs> You know, to I put my systematic, well, I've had my systematic theologian hat on all day. So, uh, but the same problem that I would say we have with, that I would have with social Trinitarianism mm -hmm. is kind of what I have with a lot of Missio Dei theology, which is, it sounds like a great idea to model social relations off of the triune God, but it's such a ambiguous conceptuality that you can actually do anything you want with it. And that's the case with Missio Dei and incarnational ministry is like, I mean, anything, the whole kitchen sink yeah, can get put on there. And so, like, what are the boundaries? So, okay. Great. Thank you very much. Yes, next question, please. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, my question is about uh, recent work has been done on the connection between the ascension and the atonement. Mm. Uh, and we often tend to think about the ascension with respect to something like enthronement. Uh, and I'm wondering, as we sort of press for a more robust understanding of what is the ongoing action after the ascension, how that helps change our imagination about uh, the role of the ascension in the life of the church with respect to mission or so on and so forth. So a lot there. <laughs> um, obviously the book of Hebrews is key here. Um, I think that ascension in Hebrews is a is, is terribly neglected uh, area of research. There's been a little bit of stuff. And, and frankly, like I have, feel like I haven't even dug my teeth in yet. Um, so I, here's how I would connect it, and I'll try not to go on too long. Um, so I, I would, in, in, insofar as in the, in the category of ecclesiology and missiology, is um, that the priestly character of Jesus and his work, I think gets reflected in the worship life of the church, especially in its sacramental understandings. Um, you know, I, I think that, and this is Douglas Farrow, and I mean, I, I'm a high church Calvinist, you know, so like we have weekly Lord's Supper and, I think that God does things with sacraments and changes the world with sacraments. And I think this is, this is related to um, his ongoing heavenly session and ministry, and that this is a distinct way that God ministers in the world. Um, so that, that's one answer to that question. I think the other interesting storyline is, um, you know, in the threefold office where you have, the, you know, uh, the, the roles of king and priest, they, they, they kind of get... And, and I think in Hebrews, they kind of have that, they kind of get bound together. And um, so the, the, one of the themes of the priestly ministry of Jesus, this comes clear, um, this becomes clear, I think, in, in Hebrews, is that he was a true human. He, he, was, he was fully human. Like, he had to be like us in every way. 
And, and part of his true humanity was that he was without sin. He was righteous. And, and, and the, one of the things about the priest, and if you go all the way back to Genesis 1 or 2, and, and the understanding of the first couple in the garden as like priest, high priest and priestess, and also kingly, that it was their full humanity what was so kind of cultically set in the garden and really essential. And so I think part of like, and, and we move, if we're moving to that question of discipleship, and I, I think Kelly Capek is going to talk about this, which I love this language of discipleship is humanization. It's to become a, a true and full human being. And so here you have the Heidelberg Catechism talks about how Jesus holds our flesh for us, our human flesh for us in heaven, right, as, as our great high priest. So anyway, there's so much there. <laughs> there's a couple ways that I would go at that. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Well, uh, let's, uh, let's thank uh, Chris again. Oh, do you have a question? I do have one okay, question. Okay, wait. Well, I Sorry, was thinking he was going to come we'll, up here we'll and say, uh, give us the second. closing. So, Matthew, uh, you get the last, uh, the last question, probably. Yeah, well, thanks. Thanks for your talk. Um, my question is related to how you set forth Stephen as the sort of non-anxious presence. Yeah. I'm just curious, as a pastor, especially in the last few years, what practices you found, whether personal or ecclesial, to help foster and embody that? Because I think that's a really key um, thing for all of us, especially those of us who are in pastoral ministry to try to do. Um, it's also very difficult. So I'm just curious to hear you reflect more on Yeah, on I that. was joking with you guys last night that someday I want to write an, an essay that how, how God used surfing to save my ministry. Um, I, I, I went through a very difficult time the past three years as a pastor, um, in addition to COVID and everything else, and uh, had to take some time off. Um, otherwise, I wouldn't be able to continue. And I, I grew up in Florida surfing, and I I, um, I just was like, I got to get out of town, and my wife let me go, and I, and I just packed up and, and hung out on the beach with some friends that had a place in North Carolina, and then I grew up in Florida, and I just chased surf. <laughs> it was very therapeutic. I had to just get away, but when I came back, I started surfing in the Great Lakes, which I had never done, which became this great uh, thing, and I you know I'm joking about this a little bit, but one of the things I learned, especially, and it was a year of recovery for me after going through some really difficult things where I was just like on the verge of resigning um, like every for a year straight, contemplating it, dreaming about it all the time. And I surfed a lot. Um, and one of the things about that is it like, s th there was a way that I could separate my identity from the church. Now the point is not surfing. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> that's not the point. But, but I learned something about Sabbath piety that one of the reasons that we become so anxious is that we don't have any boundaries. Mm -hmm. We don't know where we start and where others end. We don't, we don't know that the expectations of us are unrealistic. Expectations of ourselves are unrealistic. And so we, you know, and then emotionally, we're all like jumbled up inside and we don't know how to sort it all out. And part of the reason is a fail, I mean, for me, I'll just say it's a failure of Sabbath piety. Of like, how do I distinguish my identity from this church that I planted? For, you know, and, and that helped me. And I, I think, you know, so as a spiritual practice, as a pastor in particular, you've got to find ways in which to separate your identity from that work in order to come back to it fresh and renewed. And I think this is true in all of life, right? You can't just meld into your marriage, like husband and wife. I mean, you're one flesh, but you're still separate. You're still distinct. And, and so, I mean, I think that if I were to put one thing, and there's a whole lot of other things that would feed into that, learning how to just, and, and, and I had to come, I had to own it from the inside. And the Lord used, you know, being in nature and some, sub-zero temperatures to help me with that. So, thanks. <laughs> yeah, that's very helpful. Uh, we would have time for one more, if there is. If not, then math. Yes, would you go to the microphone, please? This will be our last question. So I'm wondering, you said you, um, you support uh, integrating, integrating faith and mission. And I'm just wondering how you support your everyday people, everyday workers. Yeah, that's a great, I mean, uh, that's what I see myself, the task every week mm -hmm. when I preach and when I lead in worship is to help renew people in their humanity as image bearers. And so um, for me, that's, that's, yeah, I mean, doing a series on forgiveness, six weeks on forgiveness and trying to give people tools to, to 
to live a forgiving life, right? And so all those, those things, I, you know, I think discipleship, a proper understanding of the discipleship of the church is that to be made a real disciple is to, to be sent out, right? To make us the kind of, give us the kind of humanity that attracts and, and goes and loves. And so I feel like that's the everyday work of the pastor. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, it seems to me that, that if, if church is non-essential, then, then come, gathering with the people of God, it's adding to an already busy life that, that it's misaligned. Rather, the gathered people of God, understanding the ascension, is this centers every other aspect of our lives. It reminds us, you know, you think of Psalm 73, David, you know, he had all these struggles, and he gathers with the people of God, and then he, his perspective changes. And so I appreciate that. I think, uh, I think that's a huge calling of, of pastors. Some of, some of us might know Tom Nelson, you know, where he would say, pastoral malpractice, in that, you know, the, the, the goal was to get everybody here, this way rather than, than equipping them for the Monday through Saturday, yeah. living out the faithfulness of uh, Jesus to Jesus Christ. Yeah, thank you so much. Let's thank Chris uh, one more time. Matthew.